thank you. Father God, we thank you for this day, this, this gray, gloomy, cloudy day, which makes us more spiritual because we're not distracted by the good weather outside. Lord, we're happy to be inside and sitting here in front of our, in front of our screens with each other, fellowshipping with each other around the word of God today. We thank you for your, the Bible, which is your truth that never changes and that your life, which is always inspiring and the words that you spoke, which are always life to us. Lord, we're looking to experience once again the eternal life of God as we study the life of Jesus today and see his ministry to people, his love for people, his compassion for people. Lord, we pray that you put this same character in us, this character that was in Christ Jesus, this way that he always looked to his Father. And Lord, we pray that, that, that you make that our habit of living as well, so that we're always looking to the Father. We're always looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. We're always relying upon the Holy Spirit inside of us to, to guide us into all truth. So Lord, we pray you bless each member of our class who's here live, those that will be watching this at some point in the future. Bless them as well. In Christ's name, amen. Yeah. Oh, and bless Wendy, because Wendy's here now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's share the screen here. Let's bring up. Let's see what we got here. All right. Oops. So let's go back. Okay, so here we are, Bible Survey 1.5. This is the ninth class. We're still in the third year of Jesus's ministry. And today we're just picking up right where we left off and Jesus is healing again. Now he's healing the daughter of a Gentile woman. Okay, remember Jesus came first for the Jewish people because he was their Messiah, but he was also going to be a light to the Gentiles. And so here we see his interaction with a Gentile woman. And Jesus and his disciples traveled northward into Gentile territory near the cities of Tyre and Sidon, along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. So they're going outside of, like Galilee, the territory of Galilee. They're going into Gentile territory. And this was the farthest Jesus traveled away from Jewish territory in all of his life, in all of his ministry, okay? This is during, during his ministry. Now, yes, as a baby, he did go down into Egypt, okay? But, you know, that wasn't his choice. It was God's choice and his parents took him there. But now as an adult, when he's doing ministry as the son of God, this is where he is making the choices, being led by God. This is the furthest away that he ever got from Jewish territory, up there along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. Um, Jesus may have gone here to get a rest from the crowds and also from the Pharisees' harassment because they kept following him around, looking at him, trying to find fault with him, always trying to accuse him, always trying to find a reason to discredit him and to maybe try to embarrass him in front of the people that, that believed in Jesus. Now, a woman in this region of Tyre and Sidon had heard about Jesus, and she begged him to heal her demon-possessed daughter. So word of Jesus' ministry and his life had reached these, this, the area far outside of Judea. Jesus ignored this woman at first, saying that ministering to Jewish people was his priority, but she persisted in her pleading. Remember, this is, this is the woman where he says, you know, I, I did not come, I did not come for dogs. And she says, well, even, even the dogs can eat the crumbs off the master's table. He was sort of testing her faith, and she had beautiful faith. And Jesus healed the woman's daughter because of her faith. And you can read this story in Matthew chapter 15. 
And then from this, Jesus taught the disciples about God's love for all people, not just the Jewish people, but for all people, Jews and non-Jews alike. After leaving Tyre and Sidon, Jesus and his disciples traveled to another Gentile region known as the Decapolis. So this is quite a bit of a journey, okay, because the Decapolis, you know, you're going from the Mediterranean Sea, you're traveling inland, and you're traveling around the outside of the Sea of Galilee to be on the eastern shore. And the Decapolis was a region near the Sea of Galilee. And the reason it is called the Decapolis is because, you know, polis means city and deca means 10. So there is a region with 10 cities in this area, and it was a center of Greek culture. Very Hellenistic, very strong Greek culture. They're worshiping Greek gods and so on. They're practicing, you know, everything that the Greeks would have practiced if they were in Greece. In the Decapolis, Jesus healed a deaf man with a speech impediment. He couldn't speak. Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit on his fingers and he touched the man's tongue. Now, did he have to do this? No. Remember, Jesus could just speak the word and somebody was healed, like he healed the centurion's uh, son or his servant. He just spoke and, you know, and on that, he was far, far away from that man's house. And that same hour when Jesus spoke, the man became healed. But Jesus was doing this because he is in the Decapolis. Okay? He is, he is doing this for everybody else that is watching what is going on. And so he puts his fingers in the man's ears. He spits on his fingers. He puts them on the man's tongue. And he can speak and he can hear again. Jesus, after he does this, he speaks a single Aramaic word, epata, which means be opened, be open. And instantly the man could hear and speak. And this healing amazed people, amazed these, these uh, Greek people because, you know, they... They were, you know, Greek culture is based upon like knowledge and philosophy and intellectualism. They probably did not believe in miracles very much unless it was like the Greek gods that were doing those kinds of things, you know. And so they, they did not see miracles happen like this until Jesus showed up and he speaks a single word, which means be open and then this man can hear and speak this amazed them this amazed them this was something different this was something unusual and it was coming from a jewish man and so the news of jesus's power spread throughout the decapolis region people are going to be interested in seeing jesus and hearing what he has to say it's different from what they're used to this is the gospel coming to them. While he's in this Decapolis region, he performs another amazing miracle. He multiplies a few fish and a few pieces of bread to feed a crowd of 4,000 people. This is in Matthew chapter 15 also. The major difference between this miracle and the feeding of the 5,000 people was the location. In one place where he fed the 5,000, those were all Jewish people. But here in the Decapolis, he's feeding 4,000 plus people, and they're all Gentiles. So he's performing similar miracles, but there's two different audiences. There are the Jews here and the Gentiles in Decapolis. By recording this second miracle, the Gospel of Matthew shows that Jesus was breaking down. He wanted to break down the wall of prejudice between Jews and Gentiles. God is going to feed the Jewish people. God is going to feed the Gentile people. There's not 
He, he makes no distinction between these two groups of people. They all need to hear the message. They all need to be fed spiritual food. They all need to be drinking of the same spiritual water that will cause them to never thirst again. And Jesus was showing he was not excluding people because of their race or their ethnic background. This was very different from the Pharisees and the other Jewish religious leaders. They were always being very exclusive. Would the Pharisees think of going to the Decapolis to preach and to teach? No, never. Nope, they were not going to do that. Would they go to Tyre and Sidon? No, no. Their ministry was exclusively to the Jewish people, but not even all the Jewish people, because some of them were oh, sinners. <laughs> so they wouldn't, even, they wouldn't even eat with them. They wouldn't sit down and have a conversation with them because they were sinners. You know, but Jesus went and ate with the publicans and, and the sinners and shared the gospel with them. So what Jesus did for the Jewish people, he was also doing for the Gentile people. He was being the light to the Gentiles, as had been prophesied by the Old Testament prophets. Well, eventually Jesus stops his traveling into Gentile territory and comes back to Galilee. And there he meets up face to face with the Pharisees again. Like he didn't have to see the Pharisees in Tyre and Sidon. He didn't have to see the Pharisees in, in the Decapolis because they were there. But now back in Galilee, there's the Pharisees and there's the Sadducees. And Jesus condemned them because they continue to ask him for a sign to prove his authority. You know, it's like, you guys. He refused their request because he knew it was futile to give new signs to people who were already blind to the signs that he had already given through his teachings and his miracles. It's like, you guys are condemning yourself. You know, when I wrote Jesus condemned the Pharisees, I mean, he's just, he's just pointing out the fact that they have condemned themselves, that they are living in condemnation because they do not believe, because Jesus did not come into con the world to condemn the world. That was probably a poor word choice on my part. He didn't come into this world to condemn the world, but through the, him, through the truth, that all people could be saved. I mean, people are already under condemnation. Christ came to save them out of that condemnation. So Jesus is saying, you guys, because you do not believe, I have shown you miracles. I have shown you signs. You have heard my words. You have heard the truth. I've been teaching and preaching among you but you do not believe. You do not believe, so you, you remain in your condemnation. You remain in your condemnation. You refuse what I'm offering to you for salvation. And so Jesus was not happy with them, of course. He's not happy that anybody would reject the truth and, and choose willingly to go against God and that and and condemn themselves to hell and then after he speaks to the the pharisees he warns his disciples to avoid the influence of these two groups the pharisees and the sadducees and he compared the pharisees and the sadducees to yeast that works its way into a lump of dough jesus said that the legalism and the hypocrisy of these two religious factions, these two religious groups, mm -hmm. could poison the mind and make the disciples inflexible and unteachable. Because that's what the Pharisees and the Sadducees were. They were not flexible. They were not teachable. They were not open to the truth. They were not open to God's truth. They were open to their truth, but their truth was not God's truth. And so they were like what we talked about in the, in the message yesterday. They had stubborn hearts. They had stubborn hearts who refused to hear what God had to say 
through God himself, Jesus Christ. They had evil hearts. They had stubborn, evil hearts that just push away the truth. We have our own truth. We have our own belief system, Jesus. We don't need your gospel. We're going to live the way that we want. And actually, we want, we want you to go away, Jesus. We want you to be quiet. And, and Jesus is saying, don't be like these groups. Don't be like the Pharisees. Don't be like the Sadducees. They are living in legalism. They're living in hypocrisy. This is not God. This is not God. Moving on, Jesus then travels north, north towards Caesarea Philippi. It's north of the Sea of Galilee, and they come to a, the village of Bethsaida, and several people brought a blind man to Jesus for healing. And Jesus took the blind man outside of the town to heal him. Normally, he just heals him people right where they are, but he took this blind man outside of the town to heal him in Mark chapter 8. Okay, again, he is, he is doing something with his hands. Jesus touched the man's eyes once, and the man was able to see, but only faint, faint images. Remember, this is the passage where the man says, I think I see trees walking. That was how he saw people. I think it looks like trees walking or something. But then Jesus touches him again. And the man can, could see everything clearly and distinctly. Now this is the only recorded miracle of Jesus that happened in two steps. It was a progressive healing. Like at first one stage one and then stage two. Now... There must be a reason why Jesus did this this way. Because every other healing that we read about in the scriptures, Jesus speaks a word, Jesus touches a person, and they are instantly healed or they come back to life. Why would Jesus have to do this touching two times? Well, some interpreters believe that this event symbolizes the gradual growth of the disciples' understanding of who Jesus was. Like they're coming to realize slowly who Jesus is. They're not seeing him clearly yet, but they have some basic understanding of who he is. And at some point, then their eyes are gonna be wide open and they're going to see Jesus who he truly is. So possibly this is the significance of Jesus healing this man in two stages. So there's, they move on path, through Bethsaida, and they're still traveling up to Caesarea Philippi. And when they arrive at Caesarea Philippi, he puts his disciples to a test. He gives them a quiz, a test. Jesus asked them who they thought he was. Not what he was being called by other people. Remember, he says, who do men say that I am? And they say, well, some people think that you're Elijah and some people blah, blah, blah. You know, he says, but wait, wait, wait. Okay. Now I'm going to ask you, who do you think that I am in Matthew chapter 16? Peter seemed to speak for the other disciples when he said, you are the Christ or you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Now, we have to know a little bit about Caesarea Philippi to appreciate this. We did this in biblical geography, too. But Caesarea Philippi was a place where Baal or Baal had been worshipped by the Canaanites in Old Testament times. Remember, there was like some sort of strange, spooky cave there in the side of this huge, huge cliff. And in Jesus' time, the city contained a temple that was devoted to worshiping the Roman emperor. So there was still this old cave, you know, that was devoted to sort of like demonic worship of, of gods, but also in this town, Caesarea Philippi, you can see the name Caesar in the name, 
okay? There's also a temple where the people worship the Roman Empire, who is not a god, right? So in contrast to these dead gods, these dead gods, these, these Roman and Greek gods that are being worshipped at this cave, and at this Roman, Roman Empire's temple, in contrast to these, Peter says Jesus is the son of the living God. Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. Not these dead gods. Because, you know, <laughs> you know, you know these, these gods, these gods, these mythological gods, they could, they could die. They could die. So, and then they, they, and they could pass away from memory as well. You know, the Romans pretty much just adopted the Greek gods. The Greek gods, all the names got changed and they became Roman gods. Okay, so like the Greek gods were dead, but now the Roman gods are alive and we're worshiping them. Well, and eventually the, the Roman Empire falls and those gods are dead and gone too. We call them mythology now. But Jesus Christ is the son of the living God because he's still alive. He always has been and always will be. Jesus is the son of the living God. Jesus is alive and he is active for his people through Jesus. We are in Christ. We are in Christ and he is in us. So this title, when they say that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Christ, Messiah, as we know, means anointed one. And this referred to the deliverer that God had promised to his people over the centuries. For many, many centuries, they're looking forward to this Messiah, this anointed one coming to, coming to deliver them. And Jesus commended P Peter for his insight. Like, wow, right answer. Ding, ding, ding. Peter, you got it right. And, but then he pointed out that Peter had not arrived at this truth through his human reason, but that he had received direct re revelation from God the Father as he observed the actions of God's Son. Like he saw Jesus, he saw him healing, he saw him casting out demons, he saw him raising people from the dead, he heard his teaching, and the Holy Spirit, you know, the God the Father through the Holy Spirit is giving Peter this revelation that this is, this is no ordinary man. This is the Messiah. This is the anointed one promised by God. He is the Christ. He has come to deliver people. Now, other people saw the same thing. The Pharisees saw the same thing. They saw his miracles they heard his teaching but did they think that jesus was the messiah no did they think that he was the christ the son of the living god no no because through human reason they could they were blind human reason is blinded to supernatural realities it came through revelation it came through revelation like the holy spirit helps people to Un receive and understand the truth like you and i before we became believers by human reason we would never have recognized jesus as being the son of god the christ but when we heard the word of god either in a church service or reading a bible or a booklet or having somebody share the gospel with us the holy spirit helped us to understand and receive the truth and then we go, well, oh, I need that. I recognize I need God. I need God's Son. I need the Savior. We need the Holy Spirit, revelation, to help us to grasp the truth. And Peter did. And he seemed to be speaking for the others as well. From that point, Jesus said, I promise I'm going to build my church and I'm going to continue my work through people like Peter who committed themselves to Jesus as their Savior and their Lord. Like when he says hey, I, on this rock, this rock, this rock, your confession of faith, this recognition of the truth, that's the gospel message. 
we're going to build the church upon this through people like you, Peter, and other disciples who recognize the truth and who believe their, the truth and put their faith into action because of the truth. We're going to build Christ's church. But then after this great confession, Jesus gave his disciples some bad news. Right after this great confession, Jesus predicted that he would be persecuted by his enemies and eventually be killed in Jerusalem. It's like, good news, bad news. <laughs> Jesus softened his bad news with the good news that he would be raised from the dead on the third day. Okay, bad news. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. My enemies will persecute me and kill me. Good news. I'm not going to stay dead. I'm going to be raised from the dead on the third day. But this prediction was hard for the disciples to accept. Who wants to hear that your best friend is going to, going to die in a horrible way and that he's expecting this to happen? And that he has accepted this as his, as his destiny. This is what's going to happen to me. And, this is, uh, and I'm okay with that. Yeah, you say you're coming back to life on the third day. But, oh Jesus, we don't want this to happen to you. And so Peter denies that such a thing could happen to the Messiah. I mean, you are the Messiah. <laughs> you know, this is not supposed to happen to you. You mean to go to the cross and die as, as an accused, horrible criminal? No, 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 no. You're the Messiah. That will not happen to you. We won't let that happen to you. We've seen that you've got this awesome power. You know, you can avoid this, Jesus. This doesn't have to happen to you. You raise people from the dead. You, you, you drive out legions of demons. You, you, you can stop this from happening. You don't have to go through that. You're the Messiah. <laughs> and Jesus responds to Peter's disbelief that this could happen and should happen. He responds to his disbelief with some of the strongest words in the Gospels. He turns to Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. Matthew chapter 16, verse 23. And we remember that at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, Satan had tried to turn Jesus away from his ministry of redemptive suffering. He didn't want Jesus to go to the cross either, trying to turn him away from that. Here he is again. He's, he's, he's now using Peter's mouth <laughs> to tempt Jesus again to use his power to avoid going to the cross. But Jesus immediately turns around and he is addressing Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Like, Peter, you're speaking the words of Satan right now. You're, 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 he's projected these thoughts into your mind and he's worked on your emotions and now he's making these words come out of your mouth. And so I'm rebuking Satan. because this is what I'm supposed to do. This is why I came into the world. If I don't go to the cross, there is no redemption. There is no salvation for the human race. There is no rec being reconciled and being, being made at peace with God. I'm not gonna take the easy way out. <laughs> I'm not going to turn. I'm not going to turn to the right. I'm not going to turn to the left. I'm going forward. I'm going. I'm. I'm going to the cross. He had this great sense of calling and mission and determination. He also had great obedience to the will of God, the plan of God for the salvation of the world. Peter's words reminded Jesus that Satan's temptation was still alive. Peter's words also helped Jesus realize 
that his disciples still did not fully understand who he was. They still did not fully understand the mission of redemptive suffering for which he had been sent into the world. It was really hard for them to understand how going to the cross and dying on the cross could accomplish God's will. How could that be God's will? They really didn't understand it at that point. They couldn't see it. So Jesus is trying his best, trying his best to help his disciples to understand who he is, what his message is, and what he must do, and how that is the will of God and, and what that will accomplish. But they still don't fully see it. They're still like, you know, the man, the man who is was blind but now can see some things he seems like trees are walking but they don't really see clearly yet and so sometimes they still are saying things like don't let that happen to you jesus you know and jesus is saying get thee behind me satan let's pause here for a moment any any comments or questions about what we've talked about so far in class Jesus didn't perform miracles for those who ask him to give signs, signs, mm -hmm. because Jesus knew that they didn't have any faith and their motive was not pure. That's right. Right. Their hearts were not pure. They did not have pure motives. It's like, you know, Jesus, we want you to dance to our to our music. We want to, we want to be the musicians, and we want to control you. Do what we ask you to do. Even we, it seems like it's a good reason, but it's really it's not, because they're not going to believe. Submit to us, Jesus. Submit to our will, not God's will. So J Jesus is not a miracle maker. <laughs> yeah. He's not a vending machine, right? No. <laughs> put your put your money in and like push the button and it gives you what you want. No, he's not like that. Jesus freely gave freely gave healings and and miracles and things like fed 5,000, 4,000 people. Nobody had to ask him to do that. That was just his compassion. This is what God was doing to help people to believe. But the Pharisees and the Sadducees had no interest in believing Jesus. Any other comments, questions? Human reason is blinded not only for supernatural, but also for just natural. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We're very limited in what we can understand, what we can figure out. We have the case of Peter, who heard that, uh, kept behind me, Satan. Mm -hmm. They can encourage us and comfort us because we can find Satan in ourselves mm -hmm. from time to time. Yeah. I mean, you think about it like <clears throat> I remember Pastor Brian Lange says, you know, our, our, our old sin nature is like we have a, this we have this little piece of Satan that lives inside of us. Who is always lying to us and always trying to get us to uh, walk away from the truth to deny Christ, to make ourselves or something else be God in our lives. You're right.
you know, what Jesus was trying to do for Peter and the other disciples is no different than what he's trying to do in our lives today. It's like, I want you to know me. I want you to understand who I am and why I do what I do. And, you know, people, sometimes we have a hard time understanding why God does things the way that he does. Like, why did God let that happen? That's always, that's a common question. Why did God let that happen? Or why didn't God do it this way? It's because we don't, we, we can't see him clearly. It's like what Paul wrote. We see in the glass dimly, darkly. It's not easy for us to see clearly everything. It'll be a, it, uh, I can't imagine what it's going to be like when we finally see Jesus face to face and everything becomes clear. Everything will make sense. There'll be no more questions. All the questions that we had here in, on this earth in this life, will suddenly all the answers will be there because Jesus is the answer. And it will be like, oh, okay. No more questions, Jesus. <laughs> I get it now. I understand it. That will be amazing. And so for now, we, we sort of have to accept the fact that we're not going to understand everything. But we just have to trust Jesus. And that's what Jesus was doing with his disciples. Is Do you trust me? Do you believe me? Do you have your faith in me? I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm trying to show you who I am so that you'll trust me. And you'll believe me, you'll put your faith, you live by what I say and what I do. And so we see that happening <clears throat> after this incident, about a week after this confession by Peter, Jesus takes Peter and James and John, they go up to a mountain to pray. And while Jesus is praying, his face takes on a strange appearance and his clothes, they're, they're glowing, bright, bright light, like white, white, white light. And this event is known as Jesus' transfiguration or Jesus' transformation. And this is in Luke chapter 9. And as this was happening, Moses and Elijah appear and they have the same bright light around their bodies. And Moses represented the Old Testament law, and Elijah represented the Old Testament prophets. And their appearance signified or symbolized that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament law. And he is also the ultimate prophet that God was sending among his people. Like, Moses and Elijah are submitting to Jesus Christ. You know, the, the Jewish people revered Moses as the being the greatest prophet. Now, now Jesus is being put on another level above Moses. He is the ultimate prophet. Elijah is also considered to be a, a great prophet. But Elijah is not, as compared to Jesus, he is lower than Jesus. And like these two are like showing like, these are the one, this is the one that we, that we, that we prophesied about. This is the one we talked about throughout the entire Old Testament. It's Jesus, it's Jesus, it's Jesus. Believe him, trust him, put your faith in him. God then speaks from a cloud. <laughs> I mean, if the message is not clear, now God is getting involved. The father says, this is my beloved son, hear him. Hear him. And this is the second of three times that God used an audible voice to express his approval of his son. This is my beloved son. Hear him. It happened at his baptism. It also happens, we're going to see it, when he makes his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. 
God speaks from heaven. There is an audible voice trying to make it so clear. This is the one. This is the one. It's not Moses. It's not Elijah. It's none of these other people. It's my son, Jesus. Jesus' transfiguration was probably God's way of giving Jesus' disciples a preview of Christ's future glory. Like he is, he is a man, but he is God. He is the God-man. And one day you're going to see him, John, in your revelation. You're going to see him glorified. We see that in, in Revelation chapter 1. You know, here's John on top of the mountain. He's seeing Jesus being glorified, being transfigured before him. And then years later on the island of Patmos, he has this amazing vision where he sees Jesus again. But he's even more glorious when he sees him this time. But he recognizes him because he saw him this day on the mountain of transfiguration. <gasps> Jesus, it's you. I saw you like this before, but not like this. This is even more so. You are, this is the, you are the Christ. Now, Jesus had told his disciples several times that he would be glorified by the Father and received into heaven before returning to earth one day in all of his glory. So Jesus was going to be glorified while he ascended into heaven and he was, he's sitting there at the right hand of the Father in heaven in, in his glory. And when he returns to the earth, his second coming, he is coming in glory. He is coming in glory. You know, there's going to be no mistaking that he is God when he comes the second time to the earth in Matthew 25. There's not going to be, well, he is just the son of a carpenter. You know, no. <laughs> This is, this is God Almighty. And this display of Jesus' glory would help sustain the disciples through the hard times of Jesus' suffering and crucifixion and death. You know, when their, faith, when their faith is weak, they can remember that day, the, what they saw on the mountain. Wait a minute, wait a minute. This Jesus, 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 we saw him glorified. God spoke. You know, I mean, they did run away. They did run away from Jesus, but they didn't abandon him altogether. Because they had this, what they had seen and heard that day to remind them that there is hope. They're hoping like, oh, we saw it like this. We heard the voice of God. We've heard what he said. He said he was going to rise again on the third day. Could it possibly be true? You know, they're still clinging on to that hope. Well, after the mountaintop experience, Jesus comes down into the valley, and there he finds his disciples in a dispute because they had been unable to cast a demon out of a boy. Like, they're arguing with each other. And there's a group of scribes there, and they were using this situation to discredit Jesus and his disciples before a crowd that had gathered. It's like, well, his disciples couldn't cast him out, so that shows you how powerful Jesus is. <laughs> Again, they're trying to tear down Jesus, make people stop believing in Jesus, putting their faith in Jesus. Well, Jesus sees this happening, and immediately he stops this controversy by healing the boy. He casts out the demon, just like that. That shut up the scribes. They had nothing to say after that. Jesus showed them his authority. Jesus showed them his power. Right in front of all these people. Now those, these people are even more likely to believe in Christ. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus' disciples later ask him why they had been unable to cast out that demon. And Jesus replied that they had failed because of their lack of faith. Jesus had delegated the power to heal. He gave them the power to heal. He delegated to him to his disciples, but they were still filled 
with doubt and with uncertainty. He said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, nothing will be impossible for you. You, you, you lack faith. You lack faith. You're, you're still filled with doubt and with uncertainty. It's like you believe, but you don't believe to the point that you actually act on it in the power of faith. But if, even, if, even if your faith is as small as a grain of mustard seed, you know, it doesn't have to be big faith. It can be small faith. But, you know, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if your faith is in me, if your faith is in God, and you're not doubting, you know, it's possible. It's possible. Okay? And it has to, and, and you know, to qualify this, you know, it also needs to be the will of God. You know, it's like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, Lord, I'm using my faith to become, you know, a, a millionaire, a billionaire. That's what I want. Now, it has to be in, in, in line with, with the will of God. You know, it can't be like for the wrong motive with an impure heart. You know, my faith is in God. I, I want to see God's will be done. And, and the Holy Spirit is impressing upon me that this, this is what God wants. And so I'm putting my faith in that. And nothing can be impossible. If God wants to do it, and he puts it on your heart, your faith, boom, it's going to happen. Right after healing this boy and having this conversation with the disciples, uh, he tells them a second time that he would soon suffer and die because he wanted to make sure that they were prepared for what would happen. Like this is nothing is going to happen by accident by coincidence, by surprise, Jesus knows what is going to happen. And Jesus calmly lets them know, this is what will happen. I will soon suffer and I will die. But this is, this is God's plan. Again, the disciples, they just could not believe Jesus' solemn words. They still do not see Jesus clearly. They still think that Jesus is going to be this conquering political military Messiah who's going to deliver them somehow from Rome, Roman oppression, and set up his great kingdom here on the earth. And they're going to be able to sit on thrones at, you know, as Jesus' you know, lieutenants and generals. Yeah. He's so powerful. How could he suffer and die? <laughs> Jesus discovered that his disciples had been arguing about which of them was the greatest. So he called them together and he taught them the true meaning of greatness in God's kingdom. You can read about this in Mark 9. Jesus said that whoever would be great must be last in earthly terms but you will be last in earthly terms but you will be number one in service to him and others so the greatest is the one who is number one in service to christ and to other people now that may may look may make you look like you are last as far as the rest of the world thinks about it you know, because in their minds, the great one is the one who is served. The great one is like the, the great king. He has many servants who wait upon him, do, do everything for him. He can tell them what to do and they do it. But Jesus said, no, no, no. You know, maybe that's the way that the world thinks. The world thinks that servants are the lowest ones. But in God's kingdom, in God's kingdom, the servant is the greatest. The servant, the one who serves God, the one who serves God's people, serves others. In God's, in God's kingdom, the servant is the greatest one. 
And so this was a big reversal, big change in what they had previously thought. And to illustrate this, Jesus called a little child to his side as an object lesson. Because a child was a perfect illustration of humility and purity in motives and thought. Jesus said that a citizen of God's kingdom must not seek fame and the praise of others, but must live to please only God. And then Jesus used the metaphor of giving a cup of water in his name to a thirsty traveler. You know, in, in hot, dry Palestine, this was an act of hospitality, you know, giving a cup of cold water in Jesus' name, like you would do for travelers. This is like an act of service. He said, even the smallest act of kindness, if it was performed in Jesus' name, this would be honored by God the Father. Like, you don't have to do great and mighty miracles, raise people from the dead. I mean, praise God if he uses you to do that. But, you know, we shouldn't overlook the daily little acts of kindness that we can perform in Jesus' name, in Jesus' spirit, with the heart of God. You know, God does not look upon those things as being small things. This pleases God, and God the Father honors even these small things. This is what he's trying to teach his disciples. There's, I don't know what they were thinking. Like Jesus is going to be the king, and we're going to be generals, and I don't know, other royal people in his kingdom because we've stuck with him all this time. We're going to have servants. People are going to serve us and wait on us. Ooh. We're going to be rich, or I don't know. Yeah. But Jesus is saying, mm, no, that's not, that's, not my, that's not my kingdom. My kingdom is a kingdom where people serve one another in humility, serve one another in kindness, serve one another in love. Because this is, this is who God is. God is the great servant. He is the greatest servant of all. You think of the humility of God. It seems like those two should not go together. Because he's God. But God is the, in, his, in great humility. You know, he, he put on flesh and Jesus came to earth. And he served us. And he gave up his life for us as a humble servant. For people who didn't even know him. For people who didn't love him. For people who didn't want him. For people who are just consumed with themselves and their lives and their selfishness and their sin. This is humility. Humility. Great humility. And Jesus is saying, this is the kingdom of God. And if you're going to be my disciples, and you will be, he's saying to most of them, not Judas, but all the rest of them, this is the way that you'll be too. And later in his ministry, Jesus repeated this lesson on greatness with his disciples. This happened when James and John came to Jesus asking for the highest places of honor in Jesus' future kingdom. And in Mark 10, 45, Jesus says, the Son of Man came not to be served like a king, but to serve in humility and to give his life a ransom for many. He's going to humble himself to the death of the cross. Peter came to Jesus with a question about forgiveness. Lord, how many times could my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Mm, as many as seven times? Peter knew that the teaching at the time was to forgive a person who had committed the same offense maybe up to three times. After that, you don't have to forgive them anymore. So Peter thought he was being really generous 
by suggesting that forgiveness could be given up to seven times. That's, a, that's more than twice as much. And Jesus' reply, he says, no, let's do it 70 times seven. And that must have shocked Peter and all the others who were listening. Jesus was saying that forgiveness had no limits for citizens of the kingdom of God. He forgives and forgives and he forgives and he forgives and thank God because we're, we're always in need of grace. We're always in, in need of mercy. We're always in need of forgiveness because, you know, we're weak and we fail. Jesus doesn't say, well, I, 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 I already forgave you three times. Three strikes and you're out. No. No limit. No limit. To make his point clear, Jesus told a parable about an unforgiving servant. Jesus described a king that forgave a huge debt that one of his servants owed him. But this man refused to show the same generosity to another servant who owed him only a small debt. And when the king in the story heard about what the unforgiving servant had done, he threw that servant in prison and demanded that he pay back every penny of his debt. And the lesson of Jesus' parable was clear. Forgiveness is a two-way street. It works both ways. Those who have been, I should say, forgiven by God, I'll have to put that in, forgiven by God, those who have been forgiven by God must extend forgiveness to others. If we have been forgiven of all of our sins, and we no longer are condemned to hell, wow, we should be forgiving others. We should be forgiving others because nobody has sinned against us the way that we have sinned against God. So we, as freely as we have received forgiveness, we should freely give forgiveness to others who ask for forgiveness. Because a harsh, unforgiving spirit cuts people off from God's grace. How are people supposed to know the grace of God? Believe that God is gracious if we, God's children, are unforgiving and ungracious. We are supposed to be, you know, Christ's brothers and sisters, right? We're supposed to be children of God the Father. Jesus Christ the Son, we're his brothers and sisters. Jesus Christ says, you know, you represent me. You're my ambassadors. You're, you're my people. You're my disciples. You're supposed to be lights of the world, just like I was the light of the world. You should be showing them, revealing to people around you the character and the nature of God. And, and God is very forgiving. God is very gracious. And you have received this forgiveness. You've received this grace. So show it to others. Give it to others so that others will experience God's grace. And maybe they'll become believers in God. They'll become Christians. They'll be saved by grace through faith and receive God's forgiveness for themselves for all their sins and become part of God's kingdom. But if we're being harsh and unforgiving and ungracious, what makes us any different from the people of the world? Who's going to want to be part of God's kingdom if we're like that? So Jesus is encouraging them, be loving, be gracious, be forgiving. Represent the Father's heart to those around you. As Jesus and his, as his, sorry, as Jesus and his disciples walked along, three men called out that they want to become his followers. But none of them were willing to make the unconditional commitment that Jesus demanded. This is also in Luke chapter 9. One of these men probably felt excited when he witnessed Jesus' great miracles. 
But Jesus questioned whether he had the perseverance to stand up to the hardships that following him demanded. Have you experienced this? It's not always easy to follow Christ. <laughs> we don't always desire to follow Christ when Jesus says, let's take a walk to the cross today. The flesh inside of us is not very excited about that. Also, when we are called upon to take a stand for the truth and we are facing people who care nothing about the truth and who actually maybe hate the truth, you know, we face persecution or ridicule or worse. It's not easy. It's not easy to persevere. It's not easy to endure these hardships. We talked about that a little bit yesterday in the morning message. You know, the world wants us to conform, to conform to its version of the truth and its ways. And sometimes it's hard to go against the tide that's in the world. We have to walk against the tide that's flowing in this direction. The current of the world is pushing in this direction. And we're walking towards Jesus in the opposite direction. Sometimes it's not easy. But that doesn't mean it's not worth it. It is, it is definitely worth it. And he's questioning this man. <clears throat> like, okay, you've seen these great miracles. You think it's going to be fun following after me. But it's not always like fun and games. Sometimes it's difficult. It's going to be difficult. You have to, have a, you have to make a commitment. But it's worth it. But are you, gonna, are you going to stick to it? Are you going to make the commitment? This is his challenge to this man. Now, the other two men were not willing, willing to make following Jesus their first priority. <clears throat> their family responsibilities prevented them from becoming disciples. So Jesus said, anyone who starts to plow and then keeps looking back is of no use for the kingdom of God. Luke 9.62 in the Good News Translation. You know, you, you got to keep your eyes on Christ. Just keep your eyes on Christ. And then you're useful in the kingdom of God. Here's the Feast of Tabernacles. We just sort of celebrated at Chusok. The Feast of Tabernacles celebrates the time during the exodus from Egypt when the Israelites lived in these crude shelters out in the wilderness. And at first, Jesus was hesitant to attend this festival because the religious leaders in Jerusalem were looking for an opportunity to arrest him on a charge of blasphemy. The, the great feast, the three great feasts of the Jewish year were all celebrated in Jerusalem and all men were expected to go. And Jesus was hesitant at first, like, oh, do I really wanna go? Because the religious leaders are gonna be there and they're gonna give me a really hard time. But Jesus decided to go, of course he did. On the last day of the festival, the priest poured water on the altar in the temple to commemorate God's provision of water for the Israelites during their wilderness years. And on that day, Jesus chose to stand up and declare that he offered life-giving water to all that would receive him. Like, that water gets poured out and it's gone, but I will give you life-giving water. If you receive me and you'll you'll not thirst this is not physical water that I'm offering you I'm offering you spiritual water that will satisfy your thirst for God's love and acceptance that's what he was saying you know you you come to the temple to try and show your love for God you come to the temple you're trying to be accept made make yourself acceptable to God well I can do that I can give you the love of God. I can give you the acceptance of God through me because I'm God and I'm doing this for you. If you receive me, if you believe me, if you put your faith in me and what I'm doing. 
Now, the claim by Jesus to be God's vessel of salvation, because that's what he was doing, this angered the religious elite of Jerusalem. They were very angry, and so the, the Pharisees and the chief priests, they sent officers immediately to arrest Jesus, like, this is it, This is just arrest him, get him off the street. But nobody laid hands on Jesus. They went to, to arrest him and they just couldn't do it. Why not? One reason is that Jesus was so popular among the people. They, they knew this would be very un, an unpopular act and that the people might even try to rescue Jesus from them. Of course, it was also not God's time for Jesus to be arrested. It was not part in it was not the right time in God's plan. And then the testimony of the, of the soldiers when they come back was like, <clears throat> was like, nobody speaks like this man. Like we were, we listened to what he had to say and we just couldn't do it. We just couldn't do it. You know, they, they, they listened and the words, the words of Christ just took away all their desire to arrest him because they were hearing the truth. It's like, why would we, we, we arrest this man when he speaks these words? So also during this time, during the Feast of Tabernacles, um, Jesus was preaching near the temple. This was like on the last day of the, of the Feast of Tabernacles. And then the scribes and Pharisees, they bring a woman to him and she was accused of adultery under the Old Testament law death by stoning was the punishment for anyone who committed this sin so the scribes and Pharisees asked Jesus what they should do to her they were hoping to trick him into making a statement that would give him grounds give them grounds for his arrest Okay, Jesus, you know the law. We know the law. What should we do? She was caught in the act of adultery. Let's hear what you have to say. And we hope you make a mistake so that we can arrest you. Jesus did not answer their question. Instead, Jesus bent down and began riding in the dirt. Then finally, Jesus looked up at the accusers and said, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Who's going to go first? Go right ahead. If you have no sin, if you don't deserve to die because you've broken the law, go right ahead. Throw a stone at her. I won't stop you. <laughs> and at this, the woman's accusers walked away. It says the oldest to the youngest because the oldest, wow, he had committed so many sins. And he was so convicted, like, yeah, you know, if, if people were to know what I did, you know, I would be, I would have been stoned a long time ago. So he dropped his stone and went away and went all the way down the line. They all went away. Jesus also refused to condemn her. Jesus was without sin. He could throw a stone at her if he wanted to uphold the law, but he didn't. He refused to condemn her. He refused to take up the stones. Instead, Jesus encouraged her to live a new life that was free from sin. Because again, he didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world from sin. He came to give people a new life new life in Christ. While he was in Jerusalem, he got into a long discussion with the Pharisees about who he claimed to be. That's what they wanted to know. Come right out and say who you are because they wanted to accuse him of blasphemy. Jesus told them clearly that he was the light of the world. I am the light of the world. That's who I am. Jesus declared that he was the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy that a great light would dawn upon the world and bring salvation 
to those who lived in darkness. So he's quoting Isaiah's prophecy. I am the one that Isaiah prophesied. I am that light. I am the light of the world. And I've come to shine into the darkness and to save people. Now the Pharisees, they know the Bible. They knew Isaiah's words. And they were so upset, so upset, you know, that they accused Jesus of being one of the worst things that they could imagine, a demon-possessed Samaritan. <laughs> John 8, 48, you are demon-possessed and you are, you, you're not even a real Jew, you're a Samaritan. Jesus denied their charge and declared that he was honoring God through the words that he was speaking. And then he turned around because everyone is watching. There's a big crowd there. Jesus promised eternal life to everyone who would put their faith in him. He's doing this right in front of the Pharisees. He's doing it to the, speaking to the crowd. Like, there is a difference between them and me. I'm offering you eternal life. Put your faith in me. So this takes the Pharisees to another level of anger. They, they raged against Jesus. They accused him of claiming to be superior to Abraham, the father of the Jewish faith, who had died, you know, thousands of years ago. And then Jesus declared, before Abraham was, I am. Those two words, I am. Jesus was saying he was the divine son of God who existed from eternity past. And at that moment, boy, they weren't just calling him names, demon-possessed Samaritan. They picked up stones. They were going to kill him right then and there. They were going to kill Jesus because he was claiming to be equal to God. And he was. But they didn't want that. They didn't want to believe that. What was in their hearts? Was God in their hearts? No, no, no. You know, Satan was in their hearts. They wanted to kill him, but Jesus slipped away. He slipped away. It's not his day to die. Isn't that interesting? Interesting, like we, we see the same thing happening today in society where people get angry angry about the truth you know and they they throw they throw rocks <laughs> you know in some places like in seattle washington where people you know they, they throw the molotov cocktails and they smash windows and burn police cars and do all these kinds of things because they get so angry angry with the truth anything that goes against what they want to believe which they call the truth. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. Thank God that God has not changed too and the truth has not changed. But it would be nice if people's hearts changed. Thank God he's changed our hearts. When we hear the truth, we don't fly into a rage, call God names, pick up stones, you know, to whoever is sharing the truth with us. Thank God there's no stones in churches. <laughs> you know, people hear, hear the truth from the pastor and like, oh, that makes me mad. Let me throw a stone. No, thank God that doesn't happen. You know, where we 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 are we come, we come to the word of God with humility. And we say, okay, God, say what you have to say. Say what you have to say, even if it hurts, even if the truth hurts, Lord. You know. What's it hurting? It's hurting, it's hurting my old sin nature. So just go at it, go at it, crucify it, take it away. Because I, I know that I'll be better off without it. I want the light of the world. I want the light in me. I don't want the darkness in me. So that's the last slide for today. Um, we'll continue in Jesus' uh, ministry, his third year of ministry tomorrow. I want to open it up now here at the end of class to see if you've got some comments or questions. Go right ahead.
Love to hear from you. Go oh, where? Well, um, I want to ask about the problem of forgiveness. Yes. Where well, forgiveness is not, I, I think that forgiveness is not so simple one where well, I want to forgive, mm -hmm. but but <laughs> the, the person who sinned, mm -hmm. if the person sinned, uh, the person sinned, don't apologize. How, how can I forgive? Apo apo apologize is the first, then I can forgive. Well, that's, I mean that that's 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 the normal way that we would think about this. Uh -huh. But I don't I don't have to forgive somebody. I don't have to wait for somebody to apologize for me to forgive them. Like uh -huh. I can forgive them in my heart. Uh -huh. I can forgive them in my heart so that I I release like this maybe this anger or this bitterness that I have uh -huh. toward them. Uh -huh. because that's not healthy for me it's uh -huh. like like they've even proven it medically speaking that people who are unforgiving are uh -huh. less healthy and they die uh -huh. younger uh -huh. <laughs> it's better for us to say okay god uh -huh. i know i this person may never apologize to me uh -huh. but i don't want to live with this bitterness in my heart uh -huh. i don't want to live with this anger in my heart uh -huh. and like there's a part of me that doesn't want to forgive them either. But Lord, I'm just asking you through your through your your word and through your spirit's power, mm. help me just to let this go and mm. and forgive this. And Lord, if if they if they come to me and they ask for forgiveness, yes, I'll give it freely. But if they never do, mm. Lord, you know, I I hand them over to you. You're the judge. You're the judge. You can deal with them. I don't have to be their judge. I don't have to punish them. Mm. You know, because sometimes people withhold forgiveness as though it's punishment. Like, I will never forgive you. I want you to feel guilty for the rest of your life. You know, we're punishing people by not forgiving them. And really, is that our place? No, mm. it's not. You know, uh, yeah, sometimes, you know, it's like that song from the movie Frozen. You would just have to let it go, let it yeah. go. Okay. <laughs> you know? Just let it go. <laughs> well, then I want to forgive, but mm -hmm. I can't re I can't forget. That's okay. That's okay. Uh -huh. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. I mean, you don't want to, you don't want it to run around in your head. Like I'm thinking about this 24 hours a day and I'm going crazy because I'm always thinking about what that person did to me. You know, you don't want that happening, mm -hmm. but it's like, you know, you don't, you don't have to forget it, but mm -hmm. you just, but you should forgive it and just let it, because an unforgiving spirit, it's a spirit. Mm -hmm. It is a spirit and it can mm -hmm. control you and make you mm -hmm. miserable mm -hmm. and, and hurt your relationship with God and hurt your relationship with people. If I have an unforgiving spirit and I'm always angry and bitter about that person, mm -hmm. that's also going to affect my relationship with the people that I love. Mm -hmm. Who's going to want to be around me because I'm always miserable and I'm always thinking about this and I'm thinking about my revenge or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's going to affect my relationships with other people. It's going to damage them and they're not going to want to be around me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's healthy for me if I can forgive it. I don't have to forget it. It's mm -hmm. great if I can, but I don't have to, but mm -hmm. I just don't want to dwell on it and let mm -hmm. Satan have a place where he can always push a button and make me get angry about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Then forgive uh, means, means not get angry about that anymore. Yeah, I, I give it, I, it's like one of those things like where, you know, Peter said, we cast all of our cares upon him. Oh, okay. like, Jesus, I'm giving this to you. Mm. I feel hurt. I mm. feel hurt. I feel angry. Mm. You know, and I, and I don't want to live that way. I want, this is one of my cares. I'm going to throw it on to you. Mm. And Lord, give me, can you please give me your peace? Can you give mm. me your joy? Can you mm. give me your love? 
Mm -hmm. because I don't want to walk around in this world as a, a miserable, angry old person. Okay, I see. So like you see these grumpy old people. Grumpy old people? <laughs> grumpy old men. Grumpy old men, like, they're always uh, talking about everything. Uh, 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 uh. Yeah, they because they have they've they've taken on this unforgiving spirit and they don't, mm. you know, and nobody likes being around them. Uh, I see. <laughs> I understand that now. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. <sighs> yeah. It's but you know, forgiveness, it's it's really it's forgiveness is supernatural. It's got it's real forgiveness is like a gift from God. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we receive it and then we can give it to others because we've received it for ourselves. And when we really appreciate how much God has forgiven us mm -hmm. and we realize how much we do not deserve God's mm -hmm. forgiveness, mm -hmm. and we realize we're being so selfish when we don't forgive other people. Mm -hmm. It becomes easier to forgive other people when we really truly appreciate how much God has forgiven us. Ah, okay, I see. Even when it comes to forgiveness, it should be simple. We have reason to forgive unconditionally mm -hmm. because ah. we are forgiven unconditionally. Ah, okay. also, I really remember that. Okay, I see. Unconditional uh, thankfulness to God mm -hmm. because of his unconditional love and grace for us. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't try to analyze why I should be thankful in this case or that case. Mm -hmm. No condition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just be thankful. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Anyone else? That was a good question, Teresa. Thanks for asking. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. good question. And so Just from my experience. <laughs> <laughs> All of our experience, yes. So be happy, just forgive. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. He just said that he came to save the mm -hmm. world, not condemn. Right. Actually, uh, saving can change people. Condemning doesn't yeah. change anyone. Right. Uh, okay, I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, his first coming was to save people mm -hmm. and the world, but on his second coming, he'll come to judge yes. the world and people. Mm -hmm. Yes. So saving comes first, mm -hmm. judging comes later. Right. Yeah. When he comes in his glory, he's going. He's going to judge the world. I mean, there will be some people who are alive on the world in on the earth who are believers who become believers during the great tribulation and he will save them he will save them but anyone who is not a believer who is living in rebellion against christ yes they, he comes to judge them and yeah he'll deal with them with his, with wrath The Jesus life on, <clears throat> on this earth is like revealing God's character to us. Mm -hmm. um, it reminds me Psalm 103 is that the, from verse 8, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He does not deal with us according to our sins, not nor repay us according to our iniquities. Mm -hmm. And yeah, verse 14, for he knows our frame. <laughs> he remembered that we are just dust. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's one of your favorite verses, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. That's Not just message. dust, evil dust. Mm -hmm. We are dust. We are dust with God's breath inside of us. 
Mm-hmm. Now we're so, just God's spirit inside of us. I think what a strange it does. <laughs> mm. We're glorious. Where we are saved and holy dust. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Holy God's and evil dust. Both. <laughs> Like God really understands us. Mm-hmm. That's that's the beauty of it, is that God understands us. He remembers, he remembers. I like that. He remembers mm-hmm. that we are that we're dust. Mm-hmm. You know, we're not, we're not, we're not angels, we're not God. <laughs> you know, we were we were born under the curse of sin, and that we mm-hmm. have an old sin nature, you know. And God, God takes that into consideration as he deals with us. Like he can't, he doesn't have the same expectation of us as he does of his holy angels. <laughs> you know, because we're not the holy angels. You know, mm-hmm. and so he is gracious, he's merciful, and he shows us forgiveness. And he doesn't s- s- get angry with us in one second. You know, he's very patient with us. Praise mm-hmm. God. Yes. Thank God. Amen. Yeah. yeah. If we could do the same thing with other people, we'd be, <laughs> you know, that would be awesome. Mm-hmm. Anybody else? All right, then let's pray. Let's pray. Here we are on a Monday morning. I I feel built up and edified after being with you. I'm excited. I love this day. This lovely spiritual gloomy day. (laughs) (laughs) Father God, we thank you for this day. Thank you. This is the day that you've made to, uh, to conform us, to make us more like your son, Jesus Christ, through the things that we've heard the things that we've received. And we know that these things that that we've received, maybe we don't consciously remember everything, but your Holy Spirit is taking it into like our our subconscious and our unconscious minds and into our hearts where he's using these things. He's using these things, these truths in our lives to transform us. Thank you, God, for the ministry of the Holy Spirit who is so faithful so faithful and we just we just need to be faithful to show up and to hear and to receive and mix faith with what we hear and just say yes that's the truth that's the way i want to live that's that's who i want to be i want to be like jesus and you do all the work god thank you thank you because we're just dust we're just dust what can we do but thank god that you do it all because you are so faithful and you love us praise you praise you we praise your name today you are worthy of all of our praise and all of our worship god and so we thank you and we praise you in jesus name amen amen Amen. 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 thank you you're welcome thank you bye thank you have a good holiday (laughs) all right (laughs) 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 (laughs)